His presentation will be Man is the Measure of All Things, Metrics, the Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Hmm. Professor Thomas Marlowe is the Program Advisor for Computer Science, has been a member of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at Seton Hall University for over 30 years. He's taught a wide variety of courses in both disciplines. Professor Marlowe enjoys working with students and with professional colleagues. Almost all of his research is collaborative. His professional interests include mathematics, abstract algebra, and discrete mathematics in computer science, program languages, real-time systems, and software engineering, and in information science, collaboration, and knowledge management. The connection between graphs and algebraic structures is a recurrent theme. Professor Marlowe has a PhD in computer science from Rutgers and a PhD in mathematics from Rutgers. Professor Marlowe has many publications and academic distinctions. He has over 70 publications in refereed conferences and journals in mathematics, computer science, and information science. Some of the more recent or significant works are included in the program, as you see. So please help me welcome Professor Thomas Marlowe. This is my uh, chance to do my annual meditation. Uh, I think even as we focus on innovation and individual projects with industry and other colleagues, at some point we have to step back and look at some of the meta issues that are going on. And that's more or less what I've been trying to do across these years. And today I want to look at metrics, the good, the bad, and the ugly. By the way, I wanted to put man and woman are the measure of all things, but that wasn't the quote, so. <laughs> One of my female reviewers told me take it out. So, <laughs> so why metrics? Well, let me say, for, I guess, forgot something. As usual, you'll find the good is boring, the bad is intriguing, and the ugly is often thought-provoking uh, thought or humorous, and we'll see that as we go along. So why metrics? Well, let's first, why are we worried? So here is an anecdote. My brother gave me this one. At one point, the federal government was looking to make minimum wage enforcement more effective. So they said, we're going to hire some investigators. We're going to give investigators some initiative to go out. We're going to base their promotion on how effective they are. And they said, let's measure effectiveness. How can we measure effectiveness? How about the amount of wages recovered? And it turns out, after a few people tried to do some of the small little things, like getting a small luncheonette to raise the wages of the waiters. Well, the, back, the cooks at least, I guess the waiters are covered by tips. Somebody hit on the fact that if you could just get businesses to pay overtime, you get a huge increase, even if those workers are already well compensated, and even if there was a union agreement to let them work for straight time, say on weekends to complete a project. So what happened, the workers who were already highly paid were the ones who got the most attention, the ones with the most job protection, and those who were earning below minimum wage, working God knows where for God knows what, got even less attention because the metric was either ill-chosen, ill-judged, or ill-enforced. But nonetheless, we need metrics. With complex projects, it's difficult to know where we are. Complex situations, complex, well, large, complex, long-lasting, repeated. We want to know how we're doing. And we want to make sure we can judge different projects, different approaches, different teams, different methods without 
relying on subjective judgment. Maybe Marta's in charge, and I know I can trust her implicitly, but in a few years they put me in charge, and God knows. So we can't do that. So we're going to go about trying to set up some metrics. We establish goals. We try to understand what we're doing to find these attributes that we need, think are going to ref be reflected in good solutions or good process or good human behavior. We establish some baselines by looking at other projects or considering what we might want out of a project. We try to evaluate status and compare to plans. We try to predict relationships, build and use models, and try to improve the process. Applications, of course, all over the place. You can read this as well as I can, probably better since I'm at an odd angle. But clearly, in the economy, education, software engineering, or any project management issue, product quality, management, process quality, process performance, long-term trends. And of course, metrics can improve communication and collaboration. I can talk to people and I can say, okay, this is what I measured. We saw a talk yesterday about academic quality as measured by research in the top 300 universities in different areas. And whatever the, your judgment of that metric, it allows us to communicate very quickly about an issue and allows people to use that information as part of their judgment. The problem is likely not that that's a completely bogus metric, but that it's a very incomplete metric. It's not something you don't want to know, but it may not be enough to know. Metrics are clearly tied to certification. Metrics interact with quality assurance, product and process evolution, process improvement, and you should definitely be tying them no matter where they come from, no matter what they're applied to, is your understanding of the requirements and the risks of the problem. This is the point where I usually pose, pause for questions, but I'm told I'm not allowed to do that, so onward. We can use metrics prospectively. We can get estimates of the cost, time, resources, of a project, under, uh, understand where there are problems, support modularization, divide up assignments so they have approximately equal time constraints, resource constraints, difficulty, interfaces, whatever you want to deal with. We can measure all these things. We can use them in retrospect to identify where we had problems so the next time we can deal with that problem. Create benchmarks for projects. We can use them to compare proposed approaches of algorithms, processes, plans, designs. We can use them to deal with changes over time. How does this metric change? And we can compare different situations. How will this function? I'm talking very broadly here, of course. But these are all benefits that if you've taken any course in software engineering or management or economy, economics, or whatever, you've seen all these things, or at least a good number of them. And you can supply examples possibly better than I can. Go ahead. Supply your examples. <laughs> OK, so what do we need for metrics? Well, as I said, we can, particularly with prospective metrics, figure out what we want, figure out, so here's our goal for the project. We realize some objectives that we say, here's what we want the project actually to do. So the goal may be we want to supply a good uh, computer interface for a learning tool. 
So our objective is the interface should be learnable and usable. So we want to measure how long it takes a new user to become familiar with us at a certain level. We want to measure how long it takes an experienced user to navigate through the menus for a set of tasks. That will be, so then I say, okay, my attribute again is timeliness, my metric, I just set one up. I'll take a random set of users, I'll take the average time, and I'll want to have the average time small and the variance not too large. I can move from a solution quality, I want my quality, I want time to respond for a software tool to be small. So that leads me pretty quickly to a metric, leads me to several metrics. Average time, medium time, median time, 90th percentile of time, all of which can be used to judge. And for ongoing metrics, I particularly want to look at aspects of a solution, usability, timeliness, performance, you can think of various. And to, to, to get good metrics, we have to involve the client, thinking again from the software end, but it applies generally, the developers, the end users, and other stakeholders as well as consider any regulatory issues. Okay, so if I'm going to get a proper metric suite, first step should be obvious, it isn't always, at least to regulators. Use common sense, be sensitive, provide regular feedback, the people, the things that are, the stakeholders of the measurements to the people who are doing the measurement and address problems with the collection and interpretation of the data. Make also sure that you fit the requirements. Use multiple attributes and metrics again when we start dealing with research excellence. We saw multiple metrics in one direction but maybe we want some other directions as well. As I said yesterday in that talk, maybe we want to look at how quickly a university is improving its research status. Or we want to look and say, has the university chosen a strategy to focus on certain centers and then look at the excellence of that center in a very narrow discipline? Because maybe that's a national or, or regional or university strategy to divide up the areas of excellence rather than focus them in a single institution. Okay, everybody tells you this next one and nobody follows it. Use metrics for improvement, for understanding, not for blame. If you must use it for credit, go ahead, but at least in the short run, don't use it for blame. And metrics also need to evolve. We'll talk about that a little more. Okay, now we have what I call the metric trilemma. We can do a project, we can run an industry, we can take your pick, a university, and have no metrics at all. And in that case, mostly we have no understanding at all, at least none that can be easily communicated none that will satisfy regulators and stakeholders. We can have very detailed, precise metrics that get into the details of what's happening and often constrain the process, constrain the product in ways that inhibit creativity, inhibit evolution. Or we can have very holistic metrics We'll get 20 experts in to evaluate how well this conference is running, and we'll take, throw out the bottom two and the top two and take the median of the remaining results or something in each dimension. Okay, Olympic standards, right? 9.3. Okay. And the other problem with holistic metrics is either they rely on the judgment of 
reviewers of the metric, the metrician, or they freeze what you're doing. They freeze instead of the step details of the process, they freeze the whole process. That's not much better. Okay. Problems. Okay, are your metrics sufficient? Do they cover the important aspects? Do all the examples fall into the domain of applicability? Are you going to be in situations where the metric doesn't apply? And in some cases, you can say, okay, I'm not going to apply that metric now. I'm not going to apply the metric of how long it takes you to do the operation just after you've had an explosion in the hospital. Okay, we'll let that go for a week. Okay, one interesting thing with metrics, this showed up in the testing of parallel programs in particular, but it's a very interesting situation. You want to understand the performance of parallel programs. One way is to put instrumentation in to say, okay, I've got to this point, I got to that point. You want to understand why a bug occurs, you put the instrumentation in. In the case of bugs, you put the instrumentation in, there's a bug, you run the program, there's a bug. You put the instrumentation in, the bug disappears. Can't make it reappear. Take the instrumentation out, there's the bug. What happened? The instrumentation itself introduced synchronization, which prevented the bug. The collection of data, even in a more human, more personal situation, or more project situation with human interactions, the very instrumentation can prevent some problems from occurring or change the nature of the problem. Sometimes just focusing on reporting the metric can, in addition to the other problems we'll see later, improve the problem. You focus more on what you're doing because you have to record it. On the other hand, sometimes and this happens with lots of situations where people have to record on their timesheets, I spent 48 minutes on this project and 37 minutes. You spend so much time and so much thought on breaking things down that you don't have the time or energy to do the actual work. Okay. Uh, what do I need for utility of metrics? Metrics ought to be useful. The best metric of your health is whether you're alive. But knowing that you've died doesn't help you improve it very much. Okay. The best predictor of success in a game, and you can think of a lot of entrepreneurial situations as games, is looking later and seeing whether you won or not. It isn't very useful. Okay. It must be well-defined in most cases, though we can tolerate certain uncertainty in the actual measurement. It must be relatively easy to quantify and evaluate. And the benefits of having the metric ought to, evaluate, ought to exceed the cost of finding the metric. And it should almost always have significant variation. If every student gets rated as excellent except for three, you're probably not doing a very good job. But if everyone in this room is rated as not having some rare tropical disease by some test, that doesn't mean the test is worthless. Right. Okay. I think we can just read this one. But the main thing says, if you're going to create metrics, you have to understand what you're doing, how you're doing it, what the requirements of the product is, and what the risks to product, project, and personnel. You try to find multiple metrics, 
and you try to make your metric fit cross-culturally if you're going to be working cross-culturally, cross-disciplines if you're going to be working interdisciplinarily, or you have to understand where the limits are, the boundaries. Okay, I'd better understand, determine the population very well. I'd better understand when it applies to what it applies. I have to understand when I have metrics that are correlated. If, a good, if good results on A tend to correlate with bad results on B, it may be very difficult, and I at least ought to understand the difficulty of trying to improve both. Okay, I need to understand distractors and confounders, things that get in the way of the proper measurement, or things where, when they occur, that tend to lower or lower the values of the metric or tend to confuse the result I get from the metric. Okay. And trying to interpret a metric without some baseline, if I'm not using it just for comparison, is about as useful as doing statistics on a sample of size one. Nonlinear metrics, okay, is a problem. Let's measure the effectiveness of a presentation by the number of slides. Well, if people are basing their presentation on the slides, two slides tends to lead to a very bad presentation. And 200 slides isn't much better. Right? And you can have problems trying to convert ordinal to numerical type. Tension between measurability and validity. I'm saying the same thing several times, but and make sure that as your environment changes, you continue to support it. If you supply multiple metrics, there's always a danger a third party will seize on one or two of them as the most important. So apply your metric in context. Use multiple metrics. Trying to take a metric that's appropriate to one context and using it in another may not be the best thing in the world. And try to avoid, if possible, at least in the short run, using metrics to trigger credit and blame. If you have multidimensional product problem spaces, you have to be aware of using a metric, beware of using a metric several time for several different things at the same time. Okay, it may be possible to do that if I take a direct metric, if I take pulse or blood pressure, it can be useful in several cases. But on the other hand, I want to be very careful if I change multiple dimensions and the metric changes because, well, oh, typical example, two years ago, we had very bad student performance. We went in, we got a new teacher, new textbook, new teaching method, new technology, new administrators, scores got much better, everything must be good. Right? Four very tricky confounders, the Hawthorne effect, when you're measuring people, People knowing that they're being measured or just getting attention. This is, comes from a case where a company, I believe it was auto production, wanted to measure, noted that productivity was low. So they went in, they said, what can we change? They increased the lighting, productivity went up. Then it's sort of tailed off. They decreased the lighting, productivity went up. What happened? The people were glad that some attention was being paid to their situation. So the metric that should have been used was how much attention is management paying? The founder effect, many projects 
pedagogy in particular, the people who start the project do wonderfully because they understand the context, they understand the method, and they're highly motivated. The next generation takes over. Learning curve, everybody's familiar with that one. Don't try to measure right away things that are supposed to be taking a long time. The teaching curve, I know for myself the best class I give in most courses is the third time I teach it. The first time I'm learning the material, the second time I'm learning the pedagogy, the third time I've got most of it right, <laughs> and after that sometimes I tend to sort of rely on having done it before. I shouldn't. Okay, metrics might not apply during changes, either because things are changing or because you're in a situation in which you're taking advantage of a prepared situation. Don't look at materiel in a chess game during a mating attack. <laughs> right. Measuring creativity is hard. Partly because you can't schedule it. Next week I will prove two theorems. Good luck. Okay, and testing can often be low, low stakes for participants and high stakes for institutions, which is very difficult. I'm going to narrate this very, very quickly, but I was at once involved with the New Jersey State Project to evaluate creativity and critical thinking at New Jersey universities. They got together a panel of individuals from multiple disciplines, multiple institutions to come up with a number of tasks and they would have students take them and evaluate universities. First problem is experts in one area had great difficulty in defining critical thinking in other areas or recognizing it in recognizing the glossary, the context of other disciplines. And it was very difficult to draft a task that gave the student enough direction but still needed creativity and critical thinking. The last, the second problem was that Basically, there was no risk, no investment for the student. We're going to use your performance to judge how well your institution has been teaching. And unless you have students who are really involved in the institution, there's no reason they have to try. So you get frivolous or lazy responses often. And then the second thing was the founder effect. Once the membership of the teams changed, the quality of the results was different. Okay, three problems for good metrics. Badly implemented, badly interpreted, wrongly applied. I'm going to speed up just a little. Two metric cycles. And this is one of the key points, the first one. Well, metric life cycle. Don't put metrics in before you understand what you're doing. Okay, but you better have something or you don't know what you're doing. Okay, base them on real honest to God attributes, not just buzzwords that somebody brought up and in fact, Russell, that's where not understanding what critical thinking is comes in. Okay. And the stakeholders also need some domain understanding to be able to interpret. Okay, major problems with refinement. We've seen some of these. Okay. And metric versioning. Culture, situation, and process. Zombie metrics. I knew I have to get to this one. Okay. A metric that used to work, the situation has changed. Right. Apply uh, metrics intended for in class teaching, lecture teaching to either the flipped classroom or online teaching and you will get very peculiar results. 
apply a metric that was intended for classical software engineering and relied on communication between processes to standard agile methods that don't require full definition of the requirements a priori, do not require that are based on classes and methods, and you're going to get awful and useless results. Metrics should come with expiration dates. Okay, and then the last, second problem. Okay. Teaching to the test, gaming the metrics, define the metric, publicize the metric. People can try to improve the metric without improving the product or process. Okay, so now we review the metric, change it, and the cycle keeps going. Okay, Campbell's Law, well recognized in social science for years and years and years. Okay, on the other hand, what if you don't tell anybody what you're measuring? Oh, we measured your project and it's not very good. What did you measure? We can't tell you. Okay, it ain't gonna work. Okay, so very, very quickly, the I, I -E, uh, I, sorry, IIIS program committee got together, we agreed 30 slides is ideal, maybe we agreed 20 slides is ideal. Okay, but, okay, I always have too many slides, so here's my first slide. Susu, my dear colleague and wonderful colleague, always has too few slides, so she's going to do this. <laughs> okay, so what about overlays? So if we don't count, I'm going to play the game like this. <laughs> and if we do count, Susu is going to play the game like this. <laughs> okay, video clips. Obviously, we can play the same game. I can just slow things up, speed things up, whatever I need to do to count right. Okay, so we won't allow video clips with the presenter. Najib, would you do a slide for me? <laughs> okay. Conclusions. Metrics are important and maybe even critical, but they can be misunderstood, misused, or misinterpreted, and that can be dangerous. Metrics must trace back to object attributes, objectives, requirements, risk, process. Must be useful. The ease of measurement is not a sufficient justification. Po if, try to use multiple and orthogonal metrics. And try to not use the same metric for different contexts unless it's clearly applicable. Mix holistic and detailed metrics. Try to use multiple evaluators for holistic metrics. Reevaluate the metric suite periodically. Don't forget, the metric is not the attribute. The measurement is not the instance. The attribute is not the objective. The objective is not the goal. Metrics are a means, not an end. Metrics must be interpreted in context. There are often multiple goals. A goal can have multiple objectives. An objective can have multiple attributes. An attribute can have multiple metrics. A metric scheme can have different implementations for different cultures, different contexts, different disciplines. And there's almost never a perfect metric suite. And beware of gaming the metrics. And finally, I wish to acknowledge a number of colleagues, including my dear friends Susu and Risa, who are unfortunately not able to be present, but extend their greetings to everyone, and to Najib, who provided much encouragement and many useful hints. Thank you. <laughs>